here and to be talking to everyone about um, my work. So um, as mentioned, I am in the Department of Fish, Wildlife and Conservation Biology, and I work on um, wildlife and conservation biology and how that intersects with um, social justice and environmental justice issues. And so I'm gonna be sharing some of that work and some work that's um, starting up with some collaborators looking at the consequences of inequitable urban environments for wildlife. So urban ecosystems are influenced by interactions among human activities, infrastructure, and biotic factors that shape biological patterns and processes. But urban ecosystems are also strongly defined by legacies of social inequity. So systemic biases have shaped past policies and planning and lending practices that strongly influence the distribution of environmental resources in urban landscapes. <clears throat> so what are some of these biases? So the first are racial covenants. And so a racial covenant, really what it is, is a white homeowner could place a covenant on their property that would prevent it from being sold to any person of color in the future. And this covenant would stay with the property uh, even after the original owner sold it or passed away. And so this process has really played a strong role in shaping the distribution of communities and demographics across the US and has led in many cases to the segregation of white communities from communities of color. And the, this ended in the 1960s, but the legacies of it still persist. And then going alongside this is the practice of redlining. So as communities were being segregated by racial covenants, the practice of redlining from 1933 to 1968 targeted different communities in cities across the US for investment or disinvestment. Okay, so essentially areas in cities were outlined usually, literally with a marker in red or green or blue and were targeted to be um, invested or disinvested in it. So what do I mean by that? So the HOLC or Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, created different grades for the different neighborhoods in different cities. And so these ran from A communities or A graded communities that were considered best. Um, and this is areas where mortgage lenders would make maximum loans up to 80% of appraisal. And these tended to be um, dominated by white populations. And then they, the grades ran from B to C to D, D being considered by HOLC as hazardous and using their original language were characterized by detrimental influences and an undesirable population or infiltration of it. <clears throat> and so it was recommended that lenders do not make loans in these areas. And these were communities of color. And so these HOLC grades and covenants and their impacts on investment and disinvestment have had significant legacy effects that persist today as environmental injustice and distributional justice issues that Stephanie did so good of highlighting. Um, and evidence from over 37 cities indicate that neighborhoods that were uh, graded C or D have more environmental disamenities such as pollution, and urban heat islands and fewer environmental amenities like parks and tree cover. And so I wanna um, highlight these patterns by actually focusing in on a place that should be familiar to most of us, Denver. And so I'm going to show you a series of maps that I generated um, to, to highlight some of this um, distributional justice issues um, as it uh, aligns with redlining practices. So um, to orient you here along the middle or sort of to the left here is the I-25 corridor. There's I-70 running along the top. Um, and then I apologize to those um, that uh, are colorblind. I know that red and green are not colorblind friendly. And it turns out when they were thinking about targeting for, me, for communities for disinvestment, they weren't also thinking about um, accessibility. So I apologize for that. Uh, but the red line communities are mostly distributed through here and then green and blue um, out here just to orient you. Okay and so the first thing we can see is that red line areas in Denver do map to racial diversity. So the polygons, the census polygons here 
um, with a higher proportion of minority populations are um, distributed more heavily in areas that have been redlined, as opposed to areas that are green or blue lined. And then uh, also redline neighborhoods um, have lower tree cover in Denver. So here, again, looking at the redline neighborhoods, the percent tree cover is less than 15% for many of these census tracts. Um, and then green line and blue line neighborhoods tend to have tree cover up to almost 70%. Redline neighborhoods have more impervious surfaces. Okay, so here the background map with this kind of darker red color shows more impervious surface cover. Um, and you can see that red line communities have uh, more of this darker color and the green and blue line communities have uh, lighter colors indicating less impervious surface. <clears throat> red line neighborhoods have more toxic release sites. So here's the EPA toxic release sites uh, distribution overlaid with, again, the red line communities. And you can see that those markers um, in their distribution uh, aligns more closely with our red line communities in Denver. Red line neighborhoods have more flood zones. So here you're looking in the dark blue areas at the 100 year flood zones across Denver. And again, you can see um, a greater distribution of that in red lined communities than in green or blue line communities. And then my team, I do a lot of work around noise pollution and its impacts on wildlife. And we recently completed a study where we're interested in the distribution of noise and whether noise pollution is inequitably distributed as well. Um, and so we compiled transportation noise data from the US Department of Transportation, mapped this to 71 US cities and calculated summary statistics on excess noise, which is noise above 45 decibels for all for the different Hulk grades uh, per city. We also calculated this N metric, which is just an area weighted measure of excess noise. So it's this little R is uh, the area covered by noise that exceeds 45 decibels, multiplied by the median noise level in a whole grade, divided by the total area, this A here, um, for uh, covered by a whole grade in each city. And what we found is that also noise is inequitably distributed. And here's just one example. We looked at many cities, but again, going back to Denver, you can see that there's more of these dark pixels, which are areas of higher uh, decibel or noise levels um, in our red line communities, right? As opposed to our green and blue line communities. And then looking at that area corrected measure of excess noise, you can see that noise increases as you move from green line to red line communities. And this has important consequences. This uh, increase is not insignificant. So um, noise below 45 decibels is considered to be very quiet, whereas when you get to 80 decibels, you're looking at possible damage um, to your eardrums from eight hours of exposure. This is equivalent to a garbage disposal. And once you get up to 100 decibels or more, you're looking at serious damage um, and reaching human pain threshold, and this is equivalent to a jackhammer or an airplane engine. So not a insignificant amounts of noise um, in these red line communities. <clears throat> and as Stephanie did a great job of already describing that this pattern is not by chance, right? Um, there's a very strong uh, distributional justice and environmental justice literature documenting how um, these different communities are disproportionately burdened by these distrib distributional justice issues, right? Um, so already sort of mentioned, but the General Accounting Office study found that three out of four hazardous waste landfills uh, were in communities of color. And again, going back to that United Church of Christ study, first one in 1987, and then the later study in 2007, consistent evidence that race was the strongest predictor of where uncontrolled toxic release sites would be located and a much stronger predictor than other variables. And so again, I sort of refer you to this vast body of environmental justice literature on why these patterns don't occur by chance. <clears throat> and so again, I am a wildlife biologist. And so I'm really interested in the consequences of 
these distributional justice issues for wildlife. And so I'm partnering with researchers across the US to study the consequences of environmental injustice for urban wildlife. And so to provide you some context for this, um, I need to introduce you to the idea or the theory of the luxury effect, which is a pattern of higher biodiversity found commonly in affluent neighborhoods, okay? So this pattern has been found globally for plant diversity and canopy or vegetative cover and generally arises because wealthy neighborhoods have more or larger urban forests, recreational parks and private green spaces and have yards or yards in wealthier neighborhoods have greater abundances and diversity of flowering plants and trees. And so these vegetative patterns can then shape animal biodiversity patterns. So wealthy neighborhoods have been found to have, for example, higher bird colonization rates, higher bird species richness and abundance, higher reptile species of richness, higher arthropod species richness, and for some bat species, the red bat and evening bat, higher activity patterns. Um, recent work by one of my collaborators, Seth Megley and colleagues found also that coyotes and raccoons in Chicago were more likely to colonize and persist in wealthier neighborhoods. So here you can look at the estimated probability that a site would be colonized by a raccoon and you can see that that probability increases as per capita income increases. And then similarly, looking at coyotes, the probability that a coyote would leave a site goes down as per capita income increases. And then some more recent work by um, Seth Magley and, and colleagues looked at the correlation between medium to large mammal species richness and a city's either income or urbanization gradient. And so looking at the coefficients here, you can see that they most across most cities found patterns of a negative relationship between urbanization and richness and a positive relationship between income and um, mammal species richness. Interestingly, they didn't find that pattern here in Fort Collins or in Denver. Um, and so because of these patterns and these findings, it's been theorized that environmental injustices can produce disparate ecological and evolutionary outcomes. And so recent work from some more of my collaborators, um, Chris Schell and colleagues, put forth a theoretical framework for how this might occur. So here in hypothetical city one, you can sort of see that these dark green polygons, which represent green spaces, um, are sort of evenly distributed across the city and the different HOLC zones, that red, yellow, blue, and green. Um, and then in hypothetical city two, you could see that um, what we more commonly find, those green spaces have a lower, um, surface area and distribution in red and um, yellow uh, zoned areas. And so it's been hypothesized that that sort of lower tree or vegetation cover and higher edge effects can diminish the niche diversity and quality, right? Diminish the habitat available to many species, which can in turn reduce genetic diversity. And then also, um, having more impervious surface cover, like more parking lots and things that don't provide habitat um, for animals can reduce animal movement into different areas, right? So if you have lower potential to move amongst these areas, there's a lower chance of having gene flow and lower genetic diversity. So you would sort of see in this city um, a convergence of traits because of that high genetic flow. And then here, disparate genetic traits because these populations are essentially isolated. And then um, it's also um, been hypothesized that this sort of distribution of green space can also impact species richness. So here in hypothetical city one, we have more habitat essentially, which provides more opportunities for a species to occupy those areas. So you would expect to have more similar patterns of species richness across these different grades. Whereas in this city, you would expect to see lower species richness in these red line areas because of the fewer habitat opportunities available. And then that sort of has cascading effects on 
um, the community itself, right? So fewer species in the system means fewer ecological interactions. Um, so lower food web diversity also in these redlined or communities that are subject to redlining. And so it's also been suggested that environmental injustice can shape pest and disease distribution. So minoritized communities experience more pests that harbor zoonotic diseases, like rats, for example. So inadequate funding for sanitation services and aging infrastructure can attract rodent pests, but also having fewer predators in the urban landscape might also um, allow an increase in rodent populations because there's no predators to keep them in check, or at least there's a smaller diversity of predators. And then going back to some of my recent research, um, looking at noise impacts. So we were interested in what are the consequences of inequitable noise for urban biodiversity. And so we conducted a literature review of 223 papers looking at noise impacts to urban wildlife from two, or 1990 to 2021. And 66 of those papers reported a specific metric or noise level that caused the impact on wildlife that they observed. And then we use that information to calculate a cumulative response curve. So what you're seeing here, each increment doesn't represent an increasing number of species responses, but it in, represents an increasing number of studies documenting a response at a given noise level. So the curve is representing an accumulation of evidence that higher noise levels matter for wildlife. So if noise didn't matter, we would expect to see an asymptote much lower down here at 80 or 60 decibels, but we don't even see that pattern until we reach above 100 decibels. And that's not even clear because there's so few data points out here. And so there's certainly some limitations to what we've done with this literature review. The literature itself was not designed to test the question of inequitable noise. And that really connects to this idea that uh, those redlined areas with these higher noise levels are really undersampled, right? Again, going back to those few data points. And then also not all taxa or biological responses are well represented in the noise literature and wildlife. Um, so there's lots of studies on birds and how their vocal behaviors change in response to noise, but fewer studies on amphibians and or at looking at how noise impacts um, life history processes like reproduction. And so that's essentially where my team is headed. I'm partnering with several collaborators in, that are all involved with the Urban Wildlife Information Network. And specifically, um, I'm, I, my partners are in the Bay Area, Chicago, Denver, and Atlanta. And so we are gonna be going in and measuring the distribution of green space, noise, and all, many other environmental factors across these different HOLC grades. And then pairing that with field observations of medium to large mammals, birds, bats, amphibians, and maybe some other species. And so that is going to be happening, uh, launching in 2022. And so hopefully this is incentive to invite me back for future um, results from this work. But this will allow us to, for the first time, investigate how the inequitable distribution of these environmental amenities and disamenities um, like noise pollution and other factors impacts wildlife. And so with that, I think I'm still under time and I'd be happy to take questions, um, but I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators on some of the work that I shared. And thank you for your time. <laughs>